the Coach Prime era has officially begun at Colorado, and it got off to a great start with a 45-42 upset win over TCU on September 2nd. In that game, the Buffaloes, led by Coach's son Shador Sanders, threw for 510 yards and four touchdowns, and they spread the ball around while doing it. Three wide receivers and a running back all had more than 100 yards receiving, including a 119-yard game from two-way sophomore phenom Travis Hunter. In this video, I'm going to show you how they did it, including a clutch fourth-quarter conversion to Hunter on third and 16, Dylan Edwards' game-winning touchdown reception with just four and a half minutes to go, and a whole lot more, so stay tuned. Let's start here with a look at the basic matchup between Colorado's offense and TCU's defense. Colorado play caller Sean Lewis is coming out of the Art Bryles Baylor coaching tree, having worked for former Bryles assistant Dino Babers from 2012 to 2017. As a part of that mold, the Buffs spent most of this game trying to spread TCU out, lining up in four wide sets on 56 out of 84 snaps. In some ways, this kind of spread offense is exactly what the Horn Frog defense is set up to defend. Under defensive coordinator Joe Gillespie, TCU runs a hyper-modern three-high safety defense, the kind of thing that originated with Iowa State, but then spread throughout the Big 12. More specifically, against Colorado's spread formations, TCU based out of what's called a broken stack alignment. So what do I mean by broken stack? TCU bases out of a 3-3-5 personnel grouping, and when most of us think 3-3-5, we probably picture something like this, with the defense putting three linemen at the first level, and then three linebackers stacked more or less behind them. So we can think of this kind of look as a more traditional 3-3 stack. When we talk about breaking the stack then, we're talking about the defense taking those three linebackers and bumping them over to one side or the other, with one of the outside linebackers walking out to play as an extra defender in coverage. For example, on this play, Colorado has three receiving threats down at the bottom of the screen, and so TCU is breaking the stack by having this linebacker walk out of the box toward them, and from this alignment, he'll be in a good position to cut off easy, inside-breaking routes like slants, square ends, or crossing routes. Why break the stack like this? Well, the idea is that when the defense can use a linebacker to take away that inside throwing lane underneath, it frees them up to play with three high safeties over the top, putting them in a look that many have dubbed the quote-unquote air raid killer, thanks to its obvious benefits against downfield spread passing attacks. Now, looking at this, you might be thinking, okay, if TCU is going to run a 3-3-5, and if they're going to walk one of their linebackers out wide like this, then that only leaves them with five guys in the box. Surely Colorado must have run the ball down their throats, right? The answer is no, not at all. Buffalo running backs only rushed for 90 combined yards, and none of them averaged more than four yards a carry. And this comes back to the basic structure of the broken stack and to TCU's Colorado game plan. Let's get into this by looking at how they defended the run on this play. Here, they're breaking the stack to the left side of the defense. So down at the bottom of the screen, they've taken this linebacker, and they've walked him out to play inside of Colorado's two receiving threats, taking away those quick underneath throws to the inside. This linebacker alignment is then paired with another feature of TCU's defense, which is how they like to play their defensive line. Throughout the game, they showed a strong preference for pinching the defensive end to the side of the running back. So on this play, the running back is offset in the shotgun to the quarterback's right. And so TCU's taken the defensive end to this side and pinched him down to play in the gap in between the right guard and right tackle. When they pinch that guy inside like this, it is all about protecting the linebacker that's playing behind him so that he's free to read the play and flow to the ball. When the defensive end lines up right in between the guard and tackle like this, he basically becomes a 280-pound roadblock because if either of those blockers wants to get up to that linebacker, they're going to have to either go through or around him to do it, and he's a big man who's trying to make sure that doesn't happen. We'll see the benefit of that on this play. Colorado's running zone to the left here, but as the play develops, it's going to end up cutting back toward that pinch defensive end and the linebacker behind him. As we start the play, keep an eye on the right guard and right tackle as they work to try and combo block that defensive end. When we pause it right here, we see that that defender is occupying both of those blockers and preventing them from getting up to the second level. This thing leaves the linebacker behind him unblocked and free to flow to the ball like I've been saying. When the running back cuts back then, that guy's just sitting there ready to step up and make the tackle. In this way, TCU's pinched defensive end and inside linebacker have done a great job of taking away the inside cutback to this side, and so now you might be wondering, what about the edges? Well, a nice feature of the broken stack is that it gives the defense a lot of width. 
On this play, for example, we know that Colorado's lining up with a slot receiver to the right side of the formation, and so to account for that guy, the Horned Frogs have broken their stack and walked out the outside linebacker to this side. From this position, in addition to playing his role in underneath coverage like we've been talking about, he's also in position to take, for example, the quarterback keeper on a zone read. If the quarterback sees TCU's defensive end pinched down inside and decides to try and keep it around the edge for himself, then that walked out linebacker will be in perfect position to close in and tackle him. Meanwhile, up at the top of the screen, Colorado's playing with a tight end on the wing, and so they don't have any extra receivers split out wide. Without the threat of a slot receiver up there, the Frogs are going to take the safety to this side and drop him down, and from this position, he becomes the walked-out defender in underneath coverage, taking away inside breaking routes like those slants that we've been talking about, while also giving the defense that extra defender on the perimeter in the run and screen games. On this play, that means that when the zone run starts to work toward him, he's free to fall inside, taking away the gap outside of Colorado's tight end. In this way then, while TCU is only playing with what we might consider five true box defenders, the walked out outside linebacker and safety on the edges are able to add in, cutting off the run from the outside in and giving the defense a sixth and seventh run defender in the fit. Now, Colorado's offensive line didn't do him a lot of favors, and TCU's D-line did a nice job of getting off blocks and falling in to make tackles, so there was a personnel element here, but from a strictly schematic standpoint, Colorado didn't have anything that let them consistently beat this broken stack structure on the ground. The passing game, however, was a very different story, and so now let's switch over to see what TCU's three-high broken stack structure meant for their coverage. Here, we see that familiar look that we've been studying. Colorado has three wide receivers down at the bottom of the screen, and so that means that that'll be the side that TCU breaks the stack to, and so the outside linebacker to this side is going to walk out and be the first line of defense against all those quick, inside-breaking throws that we've been talking about. On the opposite side, there's no extra receiving threat in the slot. When this is the case, there are a couple of different things that TCU can do, but on this play, they're pulling their cornerback inside and playing him in that kind of overhang role, defending quick, inside-breaking routes, and preparing to fall in versus the run. One consequence of this is that when that cornerback stays inside and underneath on the edge like this, TCU only has four more defensive backs to cover Colorado's four wide receiving threats, and there's nobody left to play as a deep help player behind them. For this reason, those guys are usually going to play some kind of loose man coverage over their receivers, and they're going to give up a significant cushion underneath themselves to make sure that they can keep everything in front of them. What this defense is really doing then is basically daring Colorado to attack it in the space outside of the underneath coverage and underneath of those off defenders. When we switch over to this play, we'll see them running a passing concept that does exactly this. Here, Colorado has three receivers up at the top of the screen, and so as we know, that means that the Horn Frogs are going to walk out this outside linebacker to play as the inside defender and in underneath coverage, while three defensive backs play over the top of those three receivers. Here, quarterback Shadur Sanders is going to end up throwing to this receiver right here, who's lined up as the number two receiver in this trip's formation, and the play is going to work because Colorado's route combination is going to do a great job of isolating that guy against the safety that's playing over him with a lot of cushion. To do this, the outside receiver is going to run a quick slant, and in the defensive structure that we've been studying, this route should occupy two defenders, pulling them down shallow into the inside. The first guy is going to be the cornerback that's lined up across from him. He's playing press man on that guy here, and so when the receiver runs his slant, that cornerback's going to come down inside with him. In addition, remember that the Horned Frogs are using their walked-out linebacker to take away that inside lane that this route's attacking. So, as that guy drops out into coverage, he's looking up that receiver and cutting the slant off, and this makes a lot of sense on second and one. That receiver's running a quick slant right at the sticks, and TCU's defense gives them a nice inside-outside bracket to take away anything that that guy might be trying to do. Next, Colorado's going to take the number three receiver in trips and use him to run off the safety that's playing over him. To do this, he's just going to go vertical and over the middle, and as we know, the safety that's covering him is going to have to run with this in loose man coverage, and so this will keep that defender out of the area that Colorado's trying to attack. With these routes then, we can see that Colorado's going to be able to occupy these three defenders, and that leaves them with a one-on-one -on -one isolation between the number two receiver lined up in between them and the safety that's playing over the top of him. To attack that guy, that receiver's first going to release outside toward the sideline. As he does this, we see that the slant by the outside receiver is working both underneath and inside of this stem, and the effect of this is that it creates an open throwing lane to the outside. 
once that receiver gets to the numbers, then he's just going to sit down underneath of that safety who's playing with a soft cushion over the top of him. And from there, all that Sanders has to do is play keep away with that defender. Here, his throw does a nice job of leading his receiver outside and back toward the line of scrimmage, making sure that that safety will never be able to make a play on the ball. Part of the reason that Colorado's passing game was so successful then was that they had a lot of different offensive ideas that could get them into that same outside underneath area. And when they had a bunch of different ways to do this, it was hard for TCU to adjust to any one of them. On this play, for example, they're going to attack that area with the number three receiver in trips, the guy who was going vertical and running off his safety on the play that we just studied. This time, though, he's going to be the guy that attacks that underneath space that TCU's giving up. After the snap, he's going to fade outside for a few steps, and then he's just going to break it off on a quick hitch. As we know, the guy who should be closest to this is the outside linebacker right here, who's responsible for widening out to take away this area. To slow him down in doing this then, Colorado's just running a light play-action fake at him. As we see, if we pause the play right here, this backfield action has held that linebacker inside, and this lets that number three receiver outflank him. The quarterback then does a nice job of hitting him early enough for him to get downfield into a seam, and he's able to pick up some extra yards after the catch. On this play, Colorado is again going to target that outside linebacker and underneath coverage. This time, though, he's not going to get caught in the box. He is going to fly out toward the sideline to get to his coverage assignment as quickly as possible. The number three receiver who was the target on the last play is on the hash here, and so if that guy were to run something short into the inside, he'd probably be running into a big hit from that linebacker. That's not a problem on this play, though, because here Colorado's using their formation and route combination to create more space outside of that defender. They're doing this by targeting the number two receiver who's starting the play farther from that linebacker in the first place, and then they're augmenting this space by giving him a very wide split most of the way out to the top of the far numbers. After the snap, the receiver on the hash is going to go vertical, again running off the safety that's playing over the top of him. The number two receiver is then going to run inside and underneath of that route, where the quarterback's able to hit him outside of the hash before the linebacker can get out to him. With plays like these, Colorado was able to keep their offense varied while simply taking advantage of the space that TCU was giving them. In the first half, this led to a lot of slow, arduous drives. While Colorado did show the ability to string together long 12 and 13 play drives, the problem with drives like this is that it only takes one mistake to get behind the chains or keep you off the scoreboard. The Buffs saw that firsthand on one drive, when they went 12 plays only to have a field goal blocked. On another drive, when a sack got them into third and 24 and forced them to punt. And on a third, which ended in a lost fumble. The combined effect of all of this was a low-scoring 17-14 first half. After halftime, though, things really started to open up. Throughout the game, TCU had done a nice job of mixing up their coverages and defensive structures, but the big difference in the second half is that when TCU got out of that base broken stack look that we've been studying, Colorado was able to hurt them with some explosive plays, and that shift started as early as the first play of the half. To set the stage for that play, let's start by looking back at this play from the first half, where the Buffaloes are lining up with two receiving threats out wide to each side of the field. To defend this, TCU's doing about what we would expect. They're in their base 3-3 personnel, and they're walking their outside linebackers out to play inside of the slot receivers to each side. What we really want to focus on, though, is the two defenders lined up over the slot receiver to the wide side of the field up at the top of the screen. Up here, we see that the outside linebackers walked out, and he's almost all the way to the hash mark. The safety's then playing over the top of him with his back foot as deep as 11 yards from the line of scrimmage. On this play then, we're actually going to see a run play where Colorado was finally able to do some damage. To understand how it works, do you remember what TCU likes to do with their defensive line? If you said that they like to pinch the end of the side of the back, then you're absolutely right. Here the back is offset and the shotgun to the left. And so the Horned Frogs are pinching their defensive end down inside to line up over the left guard. To take advantage of that pinched defender and of the wide alignments being used by the Horned Frog outside linebackers, Colorado's going to run a pin and pull play. The pin part of this is going to come from the left tackle, who's going to block back on that pinch defensive end, taking advantage of his leverage to seal him off to the inside. The pull part is then going to come from the two guards. So, the left guard's going to go first, and he's going to widen to kick out the outside linebacker. 
as we've seen. That guy's walked almost all the way out to the hash, and so when the left guard pulls to kick him out, it creates a sizable lane between that block and TCU's defensive line to the inside. The right guard then is going to pull across the formation and lead up through that lane where he's looking to take out the middle linebacker. With those guys blocked, it leaves TCU's deep safeties as the last line of defense against the run, and they're not going to be able to get to the back until he's already broken through the second level for a nice gain. On the first play of the second half then, Colorado was again lined up with two receiving threats out wide to each side of the field, but this time TCU's making an adjustment that's trying to solve two problems that we've seen. First, they want to constrict that wide running lane that we just saw between the outside linebackers and the rest of the box, and so they're doing this by pulling those guys in tighter to the core of the formation. When you pull those linebackers in tight, though, it increases the amount of space outside of them and underneath coverage, and that's the area that TCU's been able to attack so effectively with the passing game. To tighten up this aspect of the defense then, the Horn Frogs are rolling down their safeties over Colorado's slot receivers, putting them into a single high coverage. Unfortunately for TCU, Colorado's made the perfect call here to attack this more compressed formation. The play's a halfback screen, and so on it, after the snap, the running back is going to widen out of the backfield. Now, we can imagine that if TCU had a defender out on the hash like they typically would in their broken stack, then that guy would be in a great position to close on this play from the outside in, getting to the running back before Colorado's blockers had a chance to get outside to him. Looking back at the pre-snap look, though, we can see why this isn't going to happen. The outside linebacker obviously is lined up much tighter to the formation, and so it's going to be relatively easy for the running back to outflank him on this misdirection screenplay. Second, remember that when that outside linebacker comes down closer to the box, it creates more space outside and in underneath coverage, and as we've seen, this means that the safety to this side has to roll down and play tighter on the slot receiver to take this space away. After the snap then, if we keep an eye on that slot receiver, we see him working back inside, ultimately to crack the weak side linebacker. When he does this, the safety that's covering him also jumps down inside to squeeze this route, trying to close up that space that Colorado's been doing such a good job of attacking. What this means then is that both that safety and the outside linebacker, instead of starting out wide and being able to close on this screen from the outside in, are now caught in a horizontal foot race with the running back as he heads to the sideline. And as those guys book it to prevent the running back from getting around the edge, they create a massive inside lane with Colorado bringing the cavalry in the form of a wall of offensive linemen. When the running back later jumps back inside to get behind that wall of humanity, the safety and outside linebacker that are running with him jump back down inside as well, but unfortunately for them, this just brings them into range of those big offensive linemen. Once the linemen get hands on those defenders, the running back has the blocks that he needs to work his magic and hit the afterburners, getting out to the sideline for a 75-yard touchdown. On this play, we're looking at Colorado's second touchdown drive of the half, and again, we see that TCU's pinched everything down inside and actually brought both outside linebackers up to play as edge defenders. In this case, in addition to just lining up tighter, both of those guys are actually blitzing and coming off the edge. Turning our attention to the bottom of the screen now, we see that because the outside linebacker to this side is rushing instead of dropping into coverage, the cornerback playing over the receiver to this side doesn't have any immediate inside help in coverage underneath. To account for this, he's tightening up his alignment and playing inside of his receiver, but that's not going to be a great option here. After the snap, that receiver, number 10, Xavier Weaver, is going to be more than happy to take the free access that he suddenly has to the sideline as he blows past that corner for a 44-yard reception. Two plays later, Dylan Edwards was able to punch it in on a play that we'll analyze in a minute, momentarily putting the buffs up 31-28. That all brings us to probably the second most clutch play of the game. To set the scene, Colorado's trailing TCU by four points here with nine minutes to go. They've gotten themselves backed up in a third and 16, and to try to get out of it, offensive coordinator Sean Lewis is using some formational magic to try and set up a deep shot to Travis Hunter. To do this, he's going with an empty backfield with a quarterback in the shotgun and no running back, something that they'd only done three times before at this point in the game. In this formation, they have three receiving threats split out wide to the top of the screen. And then the remaining two receiving threats are down at the bottom, with Travis Hunter being the inside receiver to this two-receiver side, as we can see him right here lined up in the slot. 
to defend this, TCU is going with their base broken stack look. So at the top of the screen, they're walking their outside linebacker out to play inside of the number three receiver in Colorado's trip set. They're then playing with three defensive backs over the top of the three receivers to this side with a cornerback over the outside wide receiver and two safeties lined up over the inside threats. This then leaves them, however, with just two defensive backs and zero linebackers walked out to the opposite side where Hunter's lined up. In this situation, TCU makes the somewhat questionable decision to contest Hunter's release, so they've taken their third safety and walked him up to play in a press alignment, and this turns out to be a critical mistake. After the snap, Hunter gets through his jam and into the seam pretty easily, and from there, he's able to make the contested catch and pick up the big third down conversion. The Buffaloes went on to score three plays later. This brings us to the last touchdown of the game and to the schematic back and forth that helped to set it up. To understand how it happened, we need to look at one more matchup that Colorado was able to exploit in a variety of ways throughout the game. A few minutes ago, we saw a long throw down the sideline to Xavier Weaver, and we talked about how he was able to get a clean release to the sideline in part because TCU was blitzing both of their outside linebackers off the edge. Well, this pressure strategy was something that TCU started to lean on in what I'll call gotta have it situations, or any time that they really wanted to push the envelope to get the defense off the field. That could be a second and medium trying to create third and long, it could be third and long itself, and critically for our purposes, it could also apply to short yardage situations like third or fourth and two. To understand how this worked, let's look at a play where things went right for the Horned Frogs earlier in the second half. Here, on second and six, they're walking both of their outside linebackers up to the edges, and again, they're going to blitz them off the edge, giving the Horned Frogs a five-man pass rush. In coverage, they're then putting four of their five defensive backs in man over Colorado's receivers, and then they're dropping the fifth defensive back back to play as a safety in the middle of the field. So far, those assignments account for 10 of TCU's 11 defenders, right? They've got a five-man pass rush and then five defensive backs playing in coverage. What we haven't talked about, though, is the running back and what happens if he releases out into the pattern. Based on what we've said so far, we can figure out that if he does release, then the only defender that's going to be left to cover him is this middle linebacker in the middle of the formation. In particular, TCU's having that guy run what's called a green dog blitz, which means that that linebacker is matching the running back whether he releases out into the pattern or whether he stays into block. If the running back runs a route, then the middle linebacker is going to cover him man to man, but if that guy stays into block, then the middle linebacker is going to blitz him, and the point of this is to prevent that running back from offering any help to any of his other blockers. On this play, the running back doesn't release, and so the middle linebacker shadows him, adding in as a delayed rusher and basically just making sure that that running back isn't free to do whatever he wants. With the running back out of the picture, TCU is able to isolate their five primary pass rushers against Colorado's five offensive linemen, creating one-on-one -on -one matchups across the board. Before long, the outside linebacker at the top of the screen is able to take advantage of this, getting around the left tackle and picking up the sack, creating third and 17, followed by a punt. Although this blitz worked well for TCU on this play, though, two of Colorado's most critical touchdowns in the second half came from the different ways that they were able to attack this matchup between the middle linebacker and the running back. Here's the first situation, which is a second and three in the red zone after that long completion to Weaver down the sideline. The ball's obviously getting close to the goal line here, and so TCU's going with that gotta have it call, with both outside linebackers blitzing off the edges, four defensive backs playing man over Colorado's split out receiving threats and their fifth defensive back playing as a help player in the middle of the field. As we now know, this look then puts the middle linebacker on the running back where he's going to be running that green dog responsibility. To attack this, the Buffaloes are running a quarterback power play with a pitch option. This means that after the snap, the offensive line is running power up the middle. Unlike on a standard power play though, they're intentionally going to leave this outside linebacker to the side of the running back unblocked. As we run it forward and pause it right here, we see that the quarterback's flashing his eyes up to read that unblocked defender. Now, if that guy were to widen and chase the running back to the outside, then the quarterback could have the option to keep the ball for himself and cut it up inside, where the offensive line's blocking that power play against the five defenders that would still be left in the box. On this play, though, the outside linebacker's blitzing and attacks the quarterback. When this happens, rather than keeping the ball and running into that blitz, he's just going to pitch it out to his running back on the perimeter. Now at this point, we've got to remember, who's responsible for that running back? Well, in this defensive look, that falls to the middle linebacker in his green dog assignment, but think about all that that guy has to deal with right here. 
on the one hand, he's got a quarterback power blocking scheme coming right at him. And so he has to read the offensive line and figure out how he's going to fit in and defend that. When Colorado pitches the ball out wide, though, that middle linebacker is also the guy that has to match the running back. He's not able to do that here. He gets outflanked, and the running back outruns him to the pylon for the go-ahead touchdown. On the game-winning touchdown, then, TCU went with a look that was in some ways similar and in some ways different. So, on this down, we don't see either of the outside linebackers walked up to the edges. After the snap, though, they are going to blitz the outside linebacker at the bottom of the screen, bringing him off the edge. Critically, this leaves TCU's defensive backs playing 3-on-3 over Colorado's three receivers, and so they're all going to man up on those guys. Colorado's running all of them down to the inside on a mesh play, and so when they do this, all of those defenders have to come down inside with them, opening up a path to the sideline around the edge. To the inside, they're then playing what's called a fiddle technique on the running back. In this technique, the two inside linebackers will basically divide up the running back between them, so whichever side the running back goes to, the linebacker to that side will cover him. On this play, Colorado's going to have the running back cross the formation before releasing into the flat down toward the bottom of the screen. That means that in this fiddle technique, the middle linebacker, who's the linebacker to this side, will have to cover him, creating another foot race to the sideline like we saw in the previous touchdown. As the play develops, we're going to see that guy just simply getting outflanked. With all of TCU's defensive backs getting pulled down inside in man coverage, that leaves nobody on the perimeter to keep the play contained. The running back gets around the corner and takes off down the sideline, giving the Buffaloes the game-winning score with just four and a half minutes left to play.